Welcome back to Indie Cult Horror, the show where I share with you interviews that I've done over the years with uh, people who are important both in front of and behind the camera in classic cult horror films from the 60s, 70s, and 80s. The very first horror convention I ever went to was Chiller TheaterCon in 1994. Uh, Chiller's a New Jersey-based convention. Um, now it's in Persephone. Back then it was in Secaucus. But um, 94 was the first year I got to go. And I was very excited. My sister took me. And the very first celebrity that I got to speak to and get an autograph from was Bill Heinzman. Now, Bill Heinzman is, as he used to sign his autographs, number one zombie. He's the first zombie that you see in Night of the Living Dead probably the single most iconic zombie in popular culture. Um, and it was a real big thrill for me. I mean, I remember he was just really sweet and kind, and we took pictures with him, he signed autographs, we talked for a while, and he was just generally a warm guy. I got to see him at a couple other conventions over the years, and he was always so sweet and loved talking to the fans, so always a great person to see. And unfortunately, uh, a while back, uh, Bill Heinzman passed away, and he was hes just genuinely missed, especially uh, when we had the 50th anniversary last year. Um, he was one of the many people that um, you just wished had been able to have been there uh, who had to make it to this event, because it was, it was, it would have been special to have him and George and all of the other people that we lost who were part of the film. So ten years after I first met Bill Heinzman at Chiller, to be able to, at another chiller in 2004, to be able to finally get the chance to interview him. As you'll see from the interview, uh, Heinzman was more than just the number one zombie. Uh, he was also uh, various jobs on a lot of Romero's films. He was still photographer, he worked on the camera crew, uh, he would do lighting on some projects, he would he certain films, he was director of cinematography even. Uh, and, he, and then also went on to work on a lot of projects with Russo as well. The two of them paired up quite often. Uh, of course, he had um, his own film, Flesh Eater, which was kind of his sequel to the story of the, zo the zombie that you meet in the original cemetery scene from Night, um, which is, it was a silly fun film. Um, but, uh, you know, he, here's definitely a great example of somebody who worked all different types of jobs on those movies. Um, he was camera crew on so many films and I think it's one of the reasons he was so happy to see that people appreciated the work that he had done and knew him not just as another ghoul. So if you could just introduce yourself? Uh, Bill Heinzman, number one zombie of Night of the Living Dead, the classic 1968 film. Cinematographer, Sometimes actor, mostly cinematographer. Actually, the first question I was going to ask you is that you are primarily a cinematographer, then, yes. right? Yes. Uh, have worked on a lot of films that a lot of people have never heard of, but uh, primarily as a cinematographer. How did you end up behind, well, I guess, first off, in front of the camera for a night? I was uh, probably the skinniest guy on the set uh, working behind the camera, and I had an old suit, and I got to be the zombie. And that's how I came about being the zombie in my life. So how does it feel to be such a, an image, part of such an icon image of you being the first zombie in the film? Well, most of the time it's a little embarrassing, uh, but kind of neat. The best part is I can go home and the people around my home know who I am, but it's no big deal. Uh, but I can pass through a lot of people and they don't know who I am. I'm just a stranger, so that's good. So aside from being a ghoul in the film, what were your other roles behind the camera? Uh, over the years? Well, what night specifically first? Behind the camera? Yes. Oh, well, uh, when I started out, I was a still photographer. I joined with George Romero's company and joined, joined with him. Uh, I was doing uh, still photography, I was doing the lighting, and then I went to the camera and got to be eventually the director of photography for Crazies and a couple other films that we did. 
I was going to ask that also. You, you worked on a lot of Romero's other films. Uh, yes, uh, there's always Manila, Jack's Wife. Most of those films are, have been re-released on video, but the names have changed. Uh, on Jack's Wife, I was the creepy, crawly guy who kept attacking the girl. But I was also second unit camera and lighting man. And on um, There's Always Vanilla, I was a drunk in the bar, typecasting, you know, I did the line. And uh, I was also grip and worked on the production. Crazies I, finished, uh, Crazies, I finally became the director of photography I shot. And uh, for about a week while George was on vacation, I directed and got broken in on so working with the, the was majority of the crew were the same people then for those films? Uh, yeah, for, except for Night of Living Dead. Night of Living Dead, by the time we did Crazies uh, and Jack's Wife, most of the people had uh, Russ and Jack. Russ had left, and then Jack joined up later. But, we all eventually worked, up, worked together uh, various times. How is it working with Romero since you've worked with him so many times? Like, what kind of a relationship working on the set? Yeah. Uh, I guess the best thing to say about the way I worked with George, that at one point he was being interviewed and he said that I could read his mind. Uh, so that made me either a good mind reader or a good director of photography. I don't know which, but... Uh, since I kept working with him, I guess I was a good director of photography, a good cameraman. So going back to night, what was that experience like? I mean, this was the first feature-length film, and just the situation of everything. How was that? How, did, how was that feeling for that? Well, um, at that point, I had left. I had joined up with Leighton Image as George Romero in 1961, and in '66, I had left. Because we weren't making any money. And I had a child and I was married, and I was the only one that was married. I had to go make a living as a still photographer again. But while I was working as a still photographer, I had free time and could join up with George and the rest of the crew to make I had a Living Dead. I invested in the film. I was asked to work on the film on weekends and whenever I had spare time, which I did. And when it eventually came out, it really felt great to see himself on a big screen. And the fact that it's become such a big cult hit, who knew? You know, but it's really great. Was there any feeling at all at the time when you guys were working on the film that you were doing something different? Or, no? We thought we were going to make a drive-in movie that could be put into the drive-ins, which in those days were equal to today's videotapes. Today they make films and they don't come out, they come out on videotape and make some money anyway. In those days, you made a film and we couldn't make it into the big theaters, we made it into the drive-ins and played with three or four other films. Well, we were lucky that it made the drive-ins, became a big hit in Europe, became a cult film that picked up by people and who knew. So how does it feel now that it, it just that the film having such an influence on people and being such a cult classic at this point? In uh, retrospect, how does that feel? I forget who said it, but somebody in the movie once said, a, "Please as punch." <laughs> <laughs> but very happy, very happy. Uh, it's, it's it's something to be in Pennsylvania, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and had tried LA a couple of times and said. And to be recognized by Hollywood as a cult classic film, and they finally did recognize the film back in the 70s. Um, that is that makes you very proud. And besides Night of the Living Dead, uh, the other worldwide thing that happened was when we were working together, George Romero and myself, we were doing sports documentaries, and I, I shot one with George. O.J. Simpson. So when O.J. killed his wife, once again we were in the forefront of publicity with the world's biggest murder case, I guess. And once again, it's like, you know, here we are in Pittsburgh and all of a sudden we're getting national notoriety because of some film. So that's pretty exciting. And 
if I were to die poor right now, I wouldn't change it. You know, I'd say, let's do it all over again, because I had a very exciting life as a cameraman and a film person. Been in the world's deepest silver mine, been in hanging out of helicopters on airboats and submarines, doing everything you could possibly think of behind the scenes shooting a camera. And I think it's one of the greatest careers you could ever have. And I would urge any kid that wanted to be a cinematographer to go for it. Could you tell me a little bit about Flesh Eater? And like, you do so many things on that. I mean, that project well, seemed to be doing everything. Yeah, Flesh Eater. Flesh Eater came about. I went to a convention in Pittsburgh where Jack, was, uh, John Russo, was there. And as I was walking around, uh, I had my badge on the Night of Living Dead, the pin when they colorized it. And people started recognizing who I was. So I went home totally amazed and said, I ought to do something about that. If people recognize me and know who I am. So I decided to make a, a movie, another movie. And of course, the reason we made Night Living Dead was because it was easy to make, cheap to make, uh, contemporary costumes and everything else, and it's easy to put zombie makeup on. So, you know, so I decided, well, we'll make another cheap zombie movie. And there were only three people on the set that were professional, the rest were amateurs and students. And I got one of the very best uh, special effects persons, who was Jerry Gertler, a student of Tom Savini, who worked on Babylon 5. And he had worked with me on Majorettes, another film that I did. And it was very, very good. And we did some of the special effects that you will not believe. The putting your arm through a girl's chest and moving the hand and reaching in, pulling another girl's heart out and eating it. You know, we did all kinds of stuff. So we just wanted to make a zombie movie that zombie lovers would love. And I think we succeeded. Uh, got some pretty good reviews. Got bad reviews. Everybody accused, a lot of people accused me of ripping off Night of Living Dead. How you rip off yourself, I don't know. Maybe didn't know who was making that. But I don't believe I was ripping myself off. Because I was being a zombie from Night of Living Dead. So, but anyway, I think a lot of people like the film and it's being brought out by uh, Media Blasters on DVD this, next year. So, and also Major X. How do you feel about, uh, well, have you seen, and what are your feelings about the sequels tonight and uh, the remake and all that kind of stuff? Uh, Night of Living Dead 30, to be quite honest with you, we did that in order to get our uh, copyright back uh, and to clean it up and get it out of the lab and renew the film and digitize it and do all the good stuff that needed done to it before we brought it away totally. Uh, the remake, the 1990 remake, I didn't think it was a good idea to turn Barbara into Macho Man. Um, my original idea, which I got voted down, was to carry on the story as it ended in 1968, just proceed further with it. Uh, that, I got voted down on that, so they did what they wanted to do. Um, Dawn of the Dead, poor galore. Didn't think it was very scary, but uh, it was another good song. You know. Day of the Dead, another good song. Uh, Children of the Living Dead, which we had nothing to do with, I thought was terrific. The comedy, and I just thought it was terrific. Both of them. More to better. Uh, let's see. And working with Russo so much, like on the majorettes and everything like that, was that a different experience completely from working as a crew before with Romero, or was that just a good partnership? No, I pretty well, when I worked with Jack, I pretty well, I'm the director of photography, and I pretty well set up the shots and everything. Same with George, and like, with, same as with George, I can pretty well know, read his mind, know what Jack wants to do, and uh, we worked well with him. So of all the different jobs you do behind the camera, or even acting included, so there's acting, there's uh, writing, editing, directing, cinematography, what's your favorite job to do on a film? You know what, I don't think, cinematography obviously would be my favorite job, but I just love to do anything. I love to edit. And when I'm working on a film, it's like the rest of the world is blocked out. 
I can put up, when I'm working on a film, I can put up with some pretty bad stuff, some pretty bad directors, some pretty bad actors. It doesn't matter because I'm working on a film. And it's just fun to work on a film. Uh, when I worked on Children of the Dead, I had a tough job. Um, the director really didn't know how to lay out shots, so I was hand holding a 35 millimeter. And I managed to get through with that. And I still had a lot of fun doing it. And I worked with Tom Savini, it's always fun to work with Tom. So, as long as I'm working on a film, I'm happy. A lot of your career has been based around horror films. Were you a fan of horror beforehand? No. I'm not a fan now. Uh, I'm a documentary fan, I'm a history fan. Uh, I think one of my favorite films is Touch of the Evil with Orson Welles. Uh, I worked with Orson Welles. I did a documentary on my own at the Smithsonian with Orson Welles doing the narration and Aaron Copeland's music. So it's not, not my forte is not horror films. It just happens to be where I get stuck. In, you know? And uh, quite frankly, that's, that's a good place to get stuck because there's all these horror films. You know? uh, it may, the the, the uh, popularity of them may go up and down, but they still stay pretty steady. There's always war fans. It's like Western fans. There's always some Western fans somewhere that you can make a movie they like. But, uh, I like documentaries. So, with the fans especially then, how does it feel coming to things like this, like conventions and meeting fans, people that... I love it. I love it. It's great. It's, uh, I, just, I just love meeting the people. It's, it's great. What else can you say? Never feels a little weird or awkward with some people, how much they're into it? Like I said, a little embarrassing sometimes, you know, because I'm, you know, I take the garbage out like everybody else. Every Sunday night, I got to take the garbage out to the garbage can, you know, and I got to farm and I got to shovel horse crap, you know, every day, just feed the horses, and the chicken, and stuff like that. So I feel like I'm a pretty normal person. I'm not a movie star, that's for darn sure. Uh, so it, it gets embarrassing sometimes. Uh, how different is filmmaking now from it still being independent in your filmmaking? How much of a difference is there now between 68 when you started? Well, it's a lot easier now with everybody doing digital, digital video. Speaking of Tom Savini, there he is there. <laughs> he said it's always a pleasure working with Tom. Hello. Ditto. 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 <laughs> But aside from the digital making things easier, is it still basically the same kind of feeling out there? Or? Oh yeah, I think so. Uh, you know, being an old time cinematographer, I cringe at some of the, the quality that people try to compare with 35 millimeter film, which you know, as long as they're comparing to 35 millimeter film, that's a problem. And, uh, when they quit comparing it, then you know the problem's over. But um, as far as the flexibility and the convenience of shooting on video and having it done right away, uh, that's always good. But as a famous cinematographer, I don't know how his name was, but once said, uh, the magic's all gone out. The magic's gone out of being a cinematographer. In the old days, when they asked the cinematographer, did we get the shot? And he said, yeah. That meant you got the shot, and you had to believe in that guy that he got the shot. Otherwise, you'd have to wait until it come back from the lab and you have the shot. Nowadays, oh, if we don't get it the first time, we'll just see it happening, we'll just do it again until we get it right. So the magic's all right. I was going to ask if you felt stereotyped with horror films, but I think you, you kind of said you already feel kind of like in, in a stereotype of horror films. Like, anything. Does that kind of hinder things? Are there things you'd like to do that you can't do because of your involvement in horror and kind of being linked to horror films? No, no I think you're pretty well free to do what you want to. I've worked on uh, some HBO films. I've worked on a couple of adventure films with uh, a fellow by the name of uh, Chris McIntyre, who's a director and writer. He's in L.A. now. Uh, so I also did a whole series of educational films for uh, career films for children. I did a lot of documentaries and uh, industrial films. I do those all the time. And making those films, the educational films, create royalties that come in that allow you to every 
once in a while go off and make a feature film of some kind, you know, uh, mostly horror, but it's cheap. Uh, and I've done a lot of low budget, just films that guys have written and they never go anywhere. But you can pretty well do what I do. Any kind of dream project that you'd like to do that you still haven't gotten yet to? There are a couple of them. <laughs> Uh, I've written a couple scripts that I would love to do someday, uh, but I, never, I don't have the budget to do them, so hopefully this gentleman right here might give me some money to do the next one, but we'll see. <laughs> Any uh, closing remarks? Anything else you'd like to add? Uh, right now I'm doing a play of Night of Living Day. I'm producing a play back at home in uh, Beaver County. Uh, the last two weeks of October, so that's keeping me pretty busy right now. And after that, I can start putting in another film somewhere. Well, I thank you for your time. You're welcome. It's a pleasure. So I hope you enjoyed that interview with Bill Heinzman. This is the last episode for 2019, but next year uh, I have plenty more episodes, more interviews that I caught back in 04 and 05 with all the people that I looked up to who worked on films from the 60s, 70s, 80s, the cult classics, the horror films. And that's what indie cult horror is all about.